Okay, and now Timmy, you can start. Hello, and welcome to the first of a three-part series on health information exchange and public health. Today, we are focusing on statewide HIE success stories and learning how statewide data sharing efforts have been essential with the COVID-19 public health emergency response. I am Timmy Leslie with Blue Path Health, and we're pleased to feature this event during the launch week of a newly formed collaboration, Connecting for Better Health, the coalition of health plans, providers, patient advocates, and healthcare st stakeholders united to support policymakers in their efforts to improve data exchange in California. You can learn more about the coalition at connectingforbetterhealth.com. Please note that we have a very large group today on the webinar and you are muted. And we are going to be using the question and answer feature to be able to interact. So please share your questions using the Q&A, not the chat. I'd like to kick us off by introducing our moderator who I am so happy and thrilled could join us today, Carla Denise Edwards. She is joining us from all the way from Michigan where she is the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer of Henry Ford Health System. Prior to Henry Ford, Carla Denise was the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Providence St. Joseph Health System. Carla Denise knows our California landscape of health information exchange well, and we're thankful for her leadership for the time that she spent here and partnered with the state to develop its strategy for high tech. Carla Denise, I think that was more than 10 years ago. Carla Denise, thank you for moderating our session today. I'll hand it off to you to introduce our panel. Thank you so much, Timmy. Um, it is so nice uh, to be welcomed and invited back to talk specifically about California. As many know, it is near and dear to my heart. People ask me where I'm from and I said, well, it depends. Is it sunny in California or is it sunny in Florida? because it's one of the two. But now I'm really learning to love Michigan despite the cold. And so I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce our panelists and three very esteemed colleagues who I've gotten the pleasure to know their work over the years as they are all champions for health information exchange. First is David Horrocks. David is the CEO of CRISP in Maryland and has been with the organization since, since, since its inception in 2009. I must admit, David and I are both Quakers, graduates of University of Pennsylvania. Not only did we graduate from Penn, but I think around the same time, David, um, so we're classmates as well. His experience with health information technology and IT in the healthcare industry has really helped catapult this organization into the health information exchange sphere. So we're so happy to have David with us. Melissa, Co-Trees and I have known each other for quite some time and it's a thrill to see you again after many years of not being able to work together because of uh, us trying to change our different parts of the world. As the CEO of Health Current, uh, she is a veteran to the health information exchange space. She also serves as the board chair of the Strategic Health Information Exchange Collaborative and is just moving mountains um, in her part of the world. And so thank you so much for joining us from Arizona, Melissa. And then last, but absolutely not least, uh, Claudia Williams. And I know Claudia, and we all know Claudia, not only from the work she is currently doing as CEO of Manifest Medics in California, but the incredible work that she has done on the national level with the Obama administration. And Claudia and I actually even go back to the Bush administration with the uh, launching of the ONC. And so it's a thrill to see you here, Claudia. The work that you've done um, in California and nationally um, speaks for itself. So I don't think any further introduction is due. I really wanna get right into this. Um, we're gonna have each one of our panelists share a little bit about the work they're doing, Maryland, Arizona, and California. And then we're gonna go into Q and A and then hopefully open it up for the audience to ask questions through the chat. So David, would you mind kicking us off and giving us some background on Chris? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm going to share my screen. And if uh, you might just nod when you can see our, our Tableau infrastructure. All good. All right. Rather than uh, any slides, I thought I'd give a quick demo of some of the work we've done in partnership with the Maryland Department of Health and particularly work that's been uh, ongoing during the COVID pandemic. Uh, you're looking at the um, Tableau infrastructure we use for all of our reporting and there's lots of things that we do sort of as a reporting hub for the community, uh, public health dashboards to uh, local health officers and others uh, routinely, but we're going to look at just the COVID information. And uh, here is, uh, this is COVID cases by zip code which is similar to information that the governor would put out on his site. Uh, I'm masking some of the counties and, uh, and date ranges here just for the public presentation. But what we do is go into a different level of detail than uh, would maybe be uh, appropriate to just put out on public websites so that local health officers and um, hospital leaders and others who are providing care and treatment can really focus their efforts so we have here as an example, uh, cases in a certain county that uh, are being uh, shown by census track, and you can see where the hotspots are or were in this particular time frame. Here is another example of uh, some random counties where we're looking at the cases, but we're not just looking, we're, we're looking at positive test percentage by um, uh, age range. And we can do the same thing on race um, and ethnicity uh, with, again, a, a level of granularity that a public health official might need or that the local hospital or um, ambulatory practices uh, might need. And we do this by combining data. And combining data is one of the core functions of, of an HIE, particularly one that functions as a, as a health data utility. Here, the hospitals collaborate to send data uh, once a day into, um, into ourselves as a, as a hub. And each hospital can see not just statewide status of ICU beds um, or ventilators or other things, but they can see the status of each of their peer organizations. So it helps with transparency. This is vaccination data. This is, again, uh, some random counties, but it shows the data by age, by uh, gender, by race and ethnicity, so that the uh, health officers can, uh, can really dig in. We have the same information by zip code, which uh, you're getting into cell sizes and such that perhaps, again, would not be appropriate for public consumption. But by combining these data sets, for instance, race and ethnicity, to, to get really accurate data, you combine claims and hospitalization data and other clinical data with what's coming from uh, the testing centers or from the immunization sites, and it improves the accuracy. And the last thing I want to show is actually in our test site. This is not live data. This is a, um, a fake practice of 300 patients, uh, but it is a service that's live for 400 um, ambulatory practices in Maryland. And it is a report that shows everyone in the practice and their immunization status. And this is pulled again in partnership with the Department of Health from the immunization registry each day. And we are combining um, again through claims and other hospitalization data uh, to get richer information. So if the doctor asked, said to me, David, you're responsible for doing outreach to our patients to try and get them immunized she'd probably want me to uh, start with by looking uh, at the patients in the practice by age. She might want me to uh, focus on certain chronic conditions, let's say diabetes here. And here we have uh, 43 individuals sort of by age in the practice um, who have been diagnosed with diabetes and we can see their immunization status and we can make notes uh, in this that other care, other people involved in the care team would see. And it's just the basic information that you would need, again, to uh, facilitate outreach. Hopefully, this is not live uh, today, but 
uh, will be able to text right out of uh, this interface or the practices will be able to text right out of this interface. Uh, and we allow the practices to answer sort of two additional questions out of here. One is how am I doing compared to my peers? And here you'll see our, our fake practice is doing much better than its reference group, which is it's the state or it could be a county. This is old data. And uh, you can see how you're doing by this, this practice, 53% of its practice has not yet received um, any immunization, but they can also see how they're doing by age, race and ethnicity compared to peers. And then the second report is how they're doing within their own practice. Are there disparities within the practice? So if this fake practice uh, would look at this, they might say, oh, well, we're not doing as effective a job in reaching out to our Hispanic patients as our non-Hispanic patients. And you would see that here in this report. So I hope that's a, a good taste of the sorts of things that, uh, that an HIE partnered with public health can accomplish. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. I can't wait to hear from your colleagues. So we'll hear from Melissa and then Claudia uh, and then go into questions because I have a ton. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you all today and to share a little bit about um, our, our experiences here at Health Current. Um, so Health Current is the statewide health information exchange in Arizona. Um, today, we have over 850 participating organizations, and a participating organization could be a solo one-doc practice. Um, it could be a, a multi-facility um, integrated delivery network. So um, you can see our what we call our participant wheel here, um, both identifying the types of stakeholders that we have. We serve healthcare providers and organizations across the continuum from health plans to ACOs to healthcare providers, uh, independent practices, FQHCs. Um, and, and in recent years, we've had a lot of work in the area of behavioral health, long-term care and, and emergency medical services. And then you can see in the, the gray box, um, really what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, at the end of 2015, just a little over five years ago, we only had 75 participating organizations. So I tell our team that we have um, really squeezed 10 plus years of pent up HIE demand into about five. Um, and we've made a huge amount of progress. We have data available today on over 12 million individuals, over 2000 portal users, over 230 um, data sources. Um, some of which represent, um, for instance, hospitals that cover 98% of the statewide discharges in Arizona. And you can see some of the other statistics there. Um, but we really have work to serve as a community data trustee. Uh, we have representation in our governance from across the stakeholder community. And we provide all of the core standard HIE services that, that you would expect. Um, but as David articulated, there's been a lot of opportunity because we have built this baseline because we do have this foundation to really expand the service and the support for the community during the pandemic. So if we can go to the next slide, this is just a simple slide that shows um, all of the green arrows actually represent uh, the data flows that occurred and it's just representative of all the ones that we have that were in place pre COVID. So we had all of this data flowing to and from healthcare providers and different organizations on the left-hand side, hospitals, labs, community health centers, practices, EMS. But you can see on the right-hand side, these are all different types of registries or systems within our state public health agency. And pre-COVID, we did have a bi-directional connection to our immunization registry. We also had a bi-directional connection to a system called AZ Peers. Um, which, which supports um, emergency and trauma um, service providers. And it was a mechanism for us to get electronic patient care records from emergency medical providers um, when we couldn't have those connections directly with their, their EPCR systems. But anything that is a blue arrow and, and that dotted uh, purple arrow is coming soon are really is progress that we have made during the pandemic. So because we have served as a as a data trustee and as a, um, 
a, a data manager for the community with all the people on the left hand side immediately in the pandemic and you can see we're clicking through here we were able to establish electronic lab reporting we were able to support the state's surge line which actually um, facilitated transfers of patients during the two surges we've had here in Arizona. And we used the ADT messages that came into the HIE. We worked with the hospital and health systems to code them with bed related information. And we passed that along to the system at the state that actually uh, facilitated real time bed capacity tracking so that patients could be transferred to different levels of care to maximize the capacity within the the entire community during pandemic surges. Um, number three there and number four, those are projects we've been funded for either by the state or by federal grants in the last six months to automate um, really reporting that has been required both during the pandemic and, and pre-pandemic related to electronic case reporting. And EM Resource is the emergency resource management system um, that the state uses and all of the statistics that have to be reported on a daily basis from hospitals, not just those that come from an EHR, but things like PPE inventory, um, like staff callouts, like how many COVID-like uh, illnesses do you have in patients in the emergency room, in the ICU, how many ventilators do you have? We are working to actually connect with new and different systems within hospitals and to increase the robustness of the data that hospitals send us so we can make those reporting requirements automatic. Um, and then finally, we're working now, um, we're actually gonna be making some, hopefully getting some uh, statutory changes approved that allows the flow of COVID vaccine information to support some of the actual activities David mentioned from our immunization system to the HIE. Because one thing that's been clear in the pandemic is there's been a lot of public health reporting. We have tried to facilitate getting data from data sources to public health wherever we can, but there's also a need to get that data that is coming into public health into the needs of the, the hands of the community, and the healthcare community, the providers, the hospitals, so that all of that care can be better coordinated um, and addressed with, with patients and with the community. So that's just a high level overview of, of what we've done historically in Arizona and what um, our, our efforts here over the last uh, five to seven years and beyond have allowed us to do in the pandemic. So let me turn it back over to Carla Denise. That was fascinating. Uh, what a huge opportunity for us that COVID has brought to really advance this work. Um, Claudia, I'm really excited to hear your presentation before we really start digging into the conversation. I think we need to unmute Claudia. Oh, sorry, ah, there we go. Next slide, please. Hi, well, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for including us in the conversation. So I just wanted to start with a brief overview and introduction to Manifest MedX. Um, today, uh, we share health records for 25 million Californians working with um, 120 plus hospitals eight health plans and thousands, uh, uh, close to a thousand ambulatory providers across the state. And similar to the situation in um, Arizona, we've grown really rapidly over the last three or four years. Um, uh, California is blessed with um, several HIEs that have a regional focus and uh, Manifest MedX has a statewide focus. So we work with health plans and providers um, in every area of the state. Similar to what David described, we really think of ourselves as a health data utility with a mission to help leaders in California enhance health, improve care and reduce costs. And what that means is really not just the kind of lookup records that we've always thought HIEs provide, but also providing alerts when, when events occur like hospitalization, analytics and reporting to identify subsets of the population and also data services that really can provide an ongoing update of care for a given health plan or provider's um, patient population. Next slide, please. So um, I'll, I'll give a particular highlight of one of the ways in which we supported, we've supported COVID um, during the pandemic. And I think 
like our my colleagues, uh, Melissa and David, really, these things are possible because of all of the hard work that providers and plans and HIEs have done over the last several years to bring together data, aggregate it, match it, deduplicate it, and clean it. So we're able to be really powerful allies and partners for public health because of the infrastructure and hard work that um, happened before. So I wanted to highlight an example in Riverside County. Riverside County is a sprawling county in the south of California that is home um, to millions of people. And during both early stages and now more recently, um, the county really wanted help to identify subsets of the population that needed additional support and outreach. So early on in the pandemic, they were interested in identifying high-risk patients, so patients with particular conditions that put them at risk of complication from COVID. And using um, the information from us, they were able to do automated outreach to all of those patients, giving them information about how to secure, you know, safely um, stay at home, but also about where to get testing. And this was able, um, one of the key strategies to be sure that everybody, especially those at higher risk, were able to follow kind of the public health guidance um, that was in place um, at the time. Just in the last two weeks, now we're faced with a new um, outreach opportunity, which is really making sure every patient who's eligible for a vaccination has an, um, knows that they're eligible and can uh, schedule an appointment. Unfortunately, like other states, we've seen that in early stages of vaccination, inequities have really been very prominent in every uh, region of the state. And it's gonna take a lot of act active outreach from trusted partners to make sure we don't um, continue that as we continue with vaccination. So again, using the information that was already compiled, we were able to, within a couple days, identify more than 100,000 patients who met the state's requirements for the age categories that were being vaccinated, but also who had recent health events that might put them at additional risk. And we were able to share that information with the county health department so they could do proactive outreach to those patients. Next slide, please. So I just wanna highlight, I, and this is something Melissa and David both mentioned, I really think that HIEs are not just serving public health directly, but we're also the connective tissue between healthcare and public health, enabling things like high-risk patient outreach, dashboards, as David uh, showed, of um, COVID distribution across the county, and this is, or across the state, is, and this is also something that MX is doing, notifications when patients test positive for COVID, and the kind of tracking that Melissa talked about um, around capacity, ED use, and things of that nature. And not only is this gonna help us have equity um, in the approaches we're taking to COVID outreach, but also it helps us reduce burden on providers that are often being asked to report to multiple uh, places, both state and federal. And really that's been a, a big challenge for them as they've tried to devote most of their resources to COVID care, but are spending a lot of time and energy on basic reporting. Uh, so that's just a quick overview, and I look forward to joining the discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Carla Denise. I'll stay on online, I guess, as we. Absolutely. Uh, and so maybe if um, Melissa and David could unmute, we can come back together. We already have questions in the chat. And one of the questions in the chat is actually one of my first questions to you all, and maybe David could start. You know, there's significant challenges still to getting um, providers um, and disparate HIEs to participate in a statewide health information exchange. I think COVID has been a blessing and a curse, right? A curse given the number of people who've been adversely impacted, as well as the high mortality rate that we've seen in the country. And I know I'm personally grieving every day, but the silver lining or the blessing has been the fact that we know we need to do better as a community, as in a health system and an ecosystem. How do you all use this as an incentive or how did having an HIE enable you to achieve some of the public health goals that you reported on David and Melissa and even Claudia? You know, where do you play in that space of getting folks to come together to ensure we can do the right things for our community, particularly around these public health issues like COVID? 
Well, we serve as this neutral venue where the community can work collaboratively and in particular where uh, our public health officials can turn when uh, they need some help with something that requires moving data out in with the field. And, and so for instance, uh, got a call said, David, we need to get uh, current levels of PPE by hospital. And we'd like you to pull that together and publish it back out to, uh, so all the hospitals can see status real time. And I said, great, we'll have the team, we'll work all weekend and we'll, we'll do that. And we were able to do that because we have this existing relationship with the Department of Health. And um, it started, I'm gonna say eight years ago when the then Secretary of Health, um, Dr. Josh Sharfstein said, hey, this HIE could be so useful for public health purposes, but we don't have the right kind of relationship. And uh, he said, we're gonna change the board. There's gonna be more public representation on the board. There is going to be more of an ability for the secretary to, to direct grant funds and other things to the HIE for this work. And there's gonna be oversight by, uh, by the state. And that really changed our, the, the nature of our relationships in ways I didn't, and I didn't fully appreciate at the time, but Josh did. And uh, you can imagine how different that conversation would have been if the Secretary of Health called me and said, David, we need you to track PPE by hospital. And I said, yes. And he says, I'm going to put an RFP out and we're going to have a 30 day <laughs> period for response. And we're going to have a bidder conference. And then we're going to award. And if there are no uh, objections, you can get going in October. You know, like that, that would not have been very helpful for the community. So having that relationship established in advance with all the protections that the state needed, all of the oversight and the protections for patients, that had to happen before the, the crisis, before the need was presenting. It was a foundation that we were able to build from. Excellent, excellent answer to the question, right? Is just having that core foundation between the state and the HIE established, right? Um, that's a great way of ensuring we get the stickiness. What other strategies, Melissa, have you all been able to deploy to make sure that your health information exchange is effective in addressing public health needs? Sure, I, I would um, agree with everything David said. I would add um, that I think having all the different types of stakeholders around the table and, and acknowledging that everybody has to come together and leave their competitive their competition at the door when it comes to sharing information. Um, we've had a lot of success in that area. We have had hospitals and health plans and other uh, community healthcare stakeholders at the table since the very beginning. And so that collaboration has been tremendous. And these are entities that, that compete on a regular basis, but they acknowledge that by sharing data, they're not necessarily competing on the sharing of data. They can compete on how the data is used to take care of their patients. And that way everybody has even access to the information that they need. Additionally, um, in addition to what David said, we've had a longstanding um, positive and supportive relationship from our state Medicaid agency. So some of the other tactics that have been utilized in Arizona um, include um, certainly funding through um, the High Tech Act, but also Arizona has, has um, implemented some very interesting and I think unique uh, levers when it comes to incentivizing participation in the HIE. Um, we have, um, Arizona Medicaid has what's called a differential adjusted payment program. And it is essentially a value-based incentive program that the state Medicaid agency um, puts out a new policy every year. And for the last five to six years, there has been HIE aspects that have graduated over time. So in 2015, 2016, hospitals were incentivized to actually participate in the HIE and send ADTs. We went from about 55% of all the discharges in the state being covered in about six months to 95%. Um, and then that has then graduated. Now we have data quality initiatives for those ADTs and we've seen significant increases in data quality. So there's other um, policy aspects and incentives that can be leveraged. Um, there's other things that can certainly be put in policy, but I would say that, you know, we wouldn't be able to do what we did in the, in the pandemic in supporting the public health 
if if we didn't have that foundation. Yeah. And then if we don't meet the needs of our community. During COVID, I had um, a call where essentially in the first you know, several weeks, all the CIOs from competing health systems were getting together and figuring out how do they get this information in their hands. We yeah. actually worked with several systems, Epic systems, Cerner systems. We, we quickly developed a solution where we actually created what we called COVID-19 dynamic alerts. So when an ADT message came in from a hospital, they wanted to know like instantaneously if that person had been tested, positive, negative timing for COVID. We actually were getting approximately 70 to 80% of the COVID lab test results at the time. And so we did an instantaneous query of our system and pushed a report back into the EHR and they linked it internally to infectious disease protocols, Excellent. other types of, of uh, uh, workflows that was worked within their systems. And they were extremely happy that we could turn on a dime, like David said, in a matter of days, Excellent. get COVID alerts out, chain, you know, work it within their workflow. And those were, um, you know, the community coming together in a crisis and, and best leveraging the, the functionality that we already, and the foundation we already have. I love it. I love it. The value prop is proven over and over again with this test case. Claudia, you know, you and I have well over, I won't tell your age, but 10 years. Long time. <laughs> yeah, experience in this space. And um, I just would love to hear your perspective specifically on this question about creating that incentive and that momentum for health systems to work with the state and the HIE, because the HIE is not always the state and the state is not always the HIE. How do you bridge those gaps? What have you seen throughout your career that adds to the success story? Yeah, I, I guess I would just take what Melissa and David talked about. And I think if I had to distill it down, I would say, um, you, you, to, to serve those public health functions, you need pretty much universal data. Like you can't provide hospital tracking if you have 50% of the hospitals. You can't do COVID alerts if you're getting 10% of the labs. So all of these really amazing use cases at, at the core rely on two things. One, being able to aggregate and like distill the data, but then also having 100% or close to 100% of the data. So one of the things I think, we're, so one of the reasons I think we're seeing less of the state level partnership in California is we don't have 100% of the data coming into MX or any of the HIEs. So I think one of the policy opportunities we'll talk about later is how do you get that, that universal dial tone so that you can actually support the state, not just in an, an individual county in these use cases. I think the other things that, slow, that might be needed to create that partnership is what David talked about an actual formalized partnership, right? Because you, like, like he said, you can't do an RFP in the middle of a pandemic to figure out how to partner. So some kind of par designation process or, or partnership is needed. You're not trying to work out all the data use agreements in the middle of a pandemic. And third, I think we're seeing across the country a lot of requests that public health share data back with healthcare. And um, honestly, we don't have the policy frameworks to do that, or we have policy in the state statute, but there's discomfort with it. And so I think, again, we're trying to solve that in the middle of the pandemic. I think we have an opportunity to say immunization data should be shared back with providers and plans. HIEs are a conduit for doing that. Here's the, the guideposts we need for that data sharing. Let's go back and look at the statute, look at our laws, make sure it all lines up. Because again, like, Melissa's trying to figure that out that right now, but um, I think I think we are the connective tissue often between healthcare and public health, but you need um, data sharing agreements, you need partnerships, and you need a universal dial tone to support that kind of relationship. And I think it's a good time now to think about how to get that in place. No, it absolutely is. You know, I was looking at some data and statistics and um, only four out of 10 hospitals have ever used an HL7 interface to share data, right? Um, and I think I read somewhere about maybe 75 to 80% of hospitals and health systems have actually participated in some type of health information exchange, be it local, regional, or state level. I think we've come a long way 
right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right from zero to 50% and zero to 80%, but there's still this last mile to go. Some of that last mile, I know for sure are rural hospitals, are smaller facilities, right? That don't have the infrastructure. And some of that last mile are those holdouts who haven't seen the value prop associated with making the investment and being participatory. Let's talk a little bit about that toggle. How do we address the needs of maybe our rural and smaller providers who haven't been able to participate just from a resource allocation? And then same time, any one of you can answer, how do you address the fact that there are some folks who are still trying to hold on to the proprietary nature of their data and just don't mm. want to play um, ball in this space. I think those are two barriers that many mm. communities are still struggling with, right? So I see everybody's heads kind of like, I'm not yeah. quite sure, but I know you guys. <laughs> can I, can, maybe I'll just mention something that Chairman Jim Wood said this week in the Assembly Excellent. Health hearing. Um, I, let's face it, there's a lot of business interests in this space. But I think what Melissa and David both said is really important. How do we treat this like a data utility where we're not competing over this core commons? But yeah, there'll be competition over being the best provider of hip replacement, right? But how do we make this something that's shared? And David pointed out one of the pieces that are, is needed, which is a governance model that allows key stakeholders to really shape the direction and make sure it's in the public purpose, right? But the other thing that, that Jim Wood said, and he, I, I'll just try to paraphrase, um, somebody said, well, providers need to trust each other. And he said, hold on a minute. I think the, we're doing this for patients. You are just the steward of the information. You're not the owner of the information. So if we can keep the needs of patients front and center, meaning better care, affordable care, seamless care, um, no medical errors, and really use that as a unifying mission to create this public data utility, I think that will serve us really well. And that there's sometimes uncomfortable conversations, yes, but I think we're all in this work for the same reason, which is the patient. And if we can keep that front and center, that really, I think, helps clarify the conversation. Yeah, it's a great point. That's a great point. Melissa or Dave. In, in the rural areas, because you mentioned that specifically, I think you do have to acknowledge that the resources are different um, and, and think about what additional support can be provided to those facilities. So I mentioned some of the opportunities for incentives that can be helpful in covering things like vendor fees. Um, but we also, and, and this is a little bit more on the operational side, we have specifically um, have a team of account managers within our organization um, who are equipped with how can different types of healthcare providers best utilize HIE services? Because as you get further into this and you've got the data flowing, then the question is, there's not a, necessarily a one size fits all on the service side. So how do you start to differentiate the way a long-term care facility can utilize data and how do you map it to their workflows and an FQHC and behavioral health and a critical access hospital? They're just different. Um, and so we are working hard to actually develop toolkits that are specific to type of provider mm. and really training our workforce to be able to really provide um, support where it's needed. And sometimes that's, you know, the basic how to use the portal or here's what alerts look like. Um, but I do think, you know, that that aspect, even thinking back to our regional extension center yeah. days, that technical assistance mm. and the yep. additional support that's needed, whether it's rural or whether it's small practices, um, it's, it's just different than larger systems. So taking that into account when you're planning your HIE work and when you're establishing, you know, the relationships and the support services is also important. You know, Melissa, you just made me think back to 15 years ago. My daughter's 15 years old, but for anybody who's young on this phone, 15 years ago, we were trying to incent providers to adopt an electronic medical record. We were right. running around the country yeah. <laughs> trying to get doctors to actually adopt an electronic medical record. And what Melissa was referring to was regulation policy mm -hmm. and finances, money that came from the federal government to try to create these regional extension centers that gave direct support mm -hmm. to individual providers, rural providers and others so that they could actually have the medical record 
to consume the data that now we're actually trying to share. David, in Maryland, you talk specifically about the relationship between the state and your HIE, and there are quite a few questions in the chat around policy and funding. Yeah. Could you speak specifically about any successful policy initiatives or financial incentives that have driven the adoption and the participation in Maryland that might be transferable to California and other places? Sure, and I, and I think it's relevant to the prior question about lack of participation in some places. I think increasingly information that's moving for public health purposes comes into the HIE uh, by mandate, honestly. Mm -hmm. And public health has done this for a long time. There are mandates for reportable conditions if uh, someone experiences an overdose, that information has to flow or is diagnosed with tuberculosis or now COVID. And uh, some states are mandating uh, that ADTs from every hospital flow. There is a little bit of a reporting burden even in those uh, rural hospitals, but it's not big. Mm -hmm. And if you do things well, you can have uh, a single, uh, you know, feed serve multiple purposes with this health data utility. So I, I think that's been very successful, um, the mandates. I know we're, you're very cautious about uh, mandates. So I'm going to qualify it in this way. And it is, uh, and it'll maybe answer also a question that Greg put into the, the Q and A. We are not mandating uh, CCDs to flow. We are mandating the things that are useful for public health like the um, COVID tests and, uh, and ADTs, but, but there are other networks, as Greg points out, that are moving CCDs. There are national networks that are doing that. In California, there are regional networks and you don't have to uh, try to subsume all of that into your health data utility. You've got to get the completeness yeah. on the things that matter. And, and we've increasingly, not just in Maryland, but in other states where we are affiliated, uh, seeing uh, mandates to do that. It raises a question about the public trust. Um, you know, privacy has also been a barrier. And I don't know if it's as much people are concerned about their own privacy. I think we're all struggling with trust. Who do we trust our data and our information with? You know, historically, mm -hmm. um, there have been practices, insurance practices and otherwise that have led to discrimination, right, as a result of someone maybe having a disease or disability or a chronic illness, and people are worried about that. There have been data leaks. There have been times where data has been breached, right, and your information now is compromised and their people are concerned about that. How do you make sure that the health information exchange that you're running and operating instills trust, but also inspires participation? And I'll just add one little caveat. I believe it was with the Cures Act, we tried to move another mile. So right back 15 years ago, we're trying to get folks to adopt an electronic health record. About 10 years ago, we we're trying to get folks to do health information exchange. Last year with COVID, we tried to move the dial on the connectivity on personal health records, right? And so we're slowly creeping up to where folks can own their own information. But I still think there's a lot of apprehension, Claudia, about this, particularly in California. What do we do to instill trust in the public and in people? I mean, I would, I would say one thing is let's, it's a super important point. And I would say, there are two things I would say. One is that we pick up the paper every day and see stories of a partnership between a big tech company and a big healthcare organization. And there are lots of questions. And generally those things are well, totally within law. But they sometimes people have questions around how is data being used? Is it being monetized? Who's benefiting from that? So the benefit of having a health data utility with governance that is multi-stakeholder, including the state, is to establish a set of, um, of, of rules of the road for, for how that occurs. And I think that often in the case of HIEs, all of us have a consenting process, opt-out consent that goes beyond HIPAA, that gives more control and more, 
and more transparency to the patient. So I think one is just there's benefit from a governance model. The other I would say though, is a lot of the trust conversations I have are really about, I don't want you undermining my business model. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes privacy is used as a, a, a reason to not do it when it's really the business driver. And information blocking combined with HIPAA actually kind of doesn't allow that any longer. So what the federal information blocking rules say is if you're allowed by law to share data, you may not hold it back. And so some of those conversations, it's going to take a while to work the culture out, right, for that. But that approach of saying you're not going to share for privacy reasons when it's really business reasons, un, it really is not going to be allowable under more anymore under that kind of approach. And then you're going to need a vehicle like an HIE to actually enable that sharing so everyone's not bombarded with requests from every single corner of the universe, right? So I think that our culture is shifting as we shift federal policy, but we're in the middle of that and it's understandable it's gonna take some time. But I, I think those are two distinctions that are important. One is let's not um, allow for business interests that don't have anything to do with patient value to make decisions about how we use data. And at the same time, let's have governance that really is transparent and allows a patient role in yes. and, and a stakeholder role in deciding um, how we build this infrastructure. The patient's always in the center. We, uh, I'll say, just speaking for Maryland, we have aimed for transparency always. There is regulation through one of our agencies. And, and frankly, as the statewide designated HIE, we have avoided the, the things that create tension between participants. I know Claudia said those things are becoming mandated Someone else can do them though. <laughs> that does not have to be us. So disputes between the payers and the, the providers about what data ought to flow when, that's just not where we focused. We focused on the public health purposes. And I think there, there will be other vehicles for, for those data flows. Yeah. Melissa. I would just add that um, I think the transparency is, is huge. Um, it's important to communicate what you're doing for what purposes and be really honest and transparent with the stakeholders and the community you're serving. We also have in Arizona patient rights that are written into state law related to health information organizations. Um, and that gives patients um, the, the ability to opt out of their information, being accessed through the HIE, to see a copy of their information available through the HIE, to know who's accessed their information in the last set period of time. Um, and, and really, then we have to prove by our actions, tell people what you're going to do, and then do it and show by your actions that you are keeping, you know, that data private and secure. Um, many of us in the HA industry have either gone through or are going through high trust certification. So having the right privacy and security um, structure in place is incredibly important. And, and we don't take those our obligations in this area lightly. So I think it's that combination of transparency, communication, and then um, you know, proving by, by our actions that, that we are doing what is necessary to actually handle data use and data exchange appropriately in alignment with all the rules and regulations and even policies that we set within our own organization that, that actually further establishes the trust. We have a permitted use policy. We've made recent changes to it to align with information blocking to make sure we're always in compliance. Um, but, but we designed that years ago because we only wanted to share what the community was comfortable sharing. And, and that established the trust. And then we continue to build on that. And as people see what the, the value and the opportunity is, they feel more comfortable um, knowing who is the one that's doing the sharing and um, and, and knowing that we've got the appropriate constraints in place uh, so that it's not you know, open access for anybody. That's really, really important. You know, we got a question in the chat from Lisa Chan. Hi, Lisa, it's Carla Denise. I really like your question and it's a little change of direction, but it's really about the role that the HIE plays and our community partners play in addressing the social determinants of health, right? So we've talked about the public health need and David, you have an awesome business model and I wanna talk about that too. Um, the public health need is clear, right, with COVID. But how do we make sure we create a value prop 
around ensuring not only are we able to facilitate people getting the right care at the right place at the right time from our delivery systems, but also perhaps expanding that scope to ensure that people get the needs met that preclude them from having their health care taken care of, those social determinants. Is there any work that any one of you respectively or that you know of that you could share with the audience being done in this space? Uh, I can go first on this one. Um, in the social determinants area, uh, we actually are partnering um, closely with our with our Medicaid agency, our 211 um, system in Arizona, and the HIE. And we recently announced um, our our selection of NowPal is our uh, closed loop referral system that will be statewide. And and this is after you know a year of having stakeholder conversations about the requirements. Again building this on the community trust. So as we move forward in that area, I think the combination of, of information coming in um, will, be, will be incredible. Um, and, and really I've, I've been extremely intrigued and interested in the area of how all these data um, points together can, can really help us fill gaps in health equity and address uh, uh, yeah. issues in the health equity space. So. That's just something on the SDOH uh, area, but I'm sure um, David can speak to the other aspects. Well, I'll say that we are trying and it's, uh, it's difficult to make quick progress, but it is an area of focus. We just from an IT standpoint, we don't have the benefit of HL7 standards across all of the community-based organizations. And that's a little bit of a challenge. We are trying to do some closed loop referral. I know Melissa is working on those as well. We have data from uh, the public schools in the District of Columbia now starting to flow to pediatricians so they can see um, attendance data when they're doing uh, checkups on, on their patients. There's a lot of consent and other things in that. So. I'd characterize it as a bit of a slow go, but uh, certainly a priority. And I agree there's so much opportunity to do good work. I cannot believe that we are almost at the end. <laughs> I'm like, I got like 30 more questions I want to ask you. So we get to ask one more question. And can so I, this- Can I oh, just okay. intersect on California? So um, California is at this really exciting place where we're reimagining Medi-Cal, Medicaid program here. And it's going to require data sharing at very extensive levels between social services and health. And I think one of the most important steps is going to be to really get rid of the underbrush of policy confusion Excellent. about how to share. And I think that's a role that uniquely the state can help us with. Um, because I would say they're one of the barriers we've heard about is the technical barriers. Not all these providers have electronic health records. But the, the, what's really slowing us down is confusion about what's allowable and what's not allowable and consent registries and all this stuff. And if that has to be like recreated in every one of the 58 counties, we're just gonna make 10% of the progress we need to make. So I think there's a really big opportunity for state policymakers to help kind of examine that in a holistic way create a set of guidelines that make sense for everyone. And then we can go about implementing that through technology, but we can't, um, play, you know, we kind of need some help, I think, to, um, pl to play our role. I think we need that bigger policy guidance role. And I know Melissa's um, going through that in her state as well. I, you know, you actually kind of answered my last question without me even asking it, because I think that's really critical. Like, what are those policy barriers, right, that are in place? And I'm, I'm looking in the chat. I'm like, I can't stand it. Greg has this question about um, capturing and reporting Z codes that can be used to address the social determinants of health. So what I'm going to say, Libby, is that we're absolutely going to have to do this again, I'm sure. I'll, I'm happy to fly to California when it's safe. I've got and two vaccinations, both my boosters, <laughs> and I'll double mask. <laughs> but as soon as it's safe for us to meet in person, I'm happy to come and be part of this. But I want to hear just lastly in our last word, because I don't want us to like get abruptly cut off um, by the Zoom land people. But Claudia, you addressed it. And so from a financial perspective and a policy perspective, if you were able to take, you know, a, a pen, a stroke of the pen, and help solve this log jam of 
active engagement and adoption of HIEs broadly, right, for public health good? What is it that you would do policy-wise or financially, you know, if you were holding that sacred pen at the state level? How could the state of California move this forward? I mean, I'll, I'll be like one minute, so because I really want to hear from these guys. I think they've already said it. I think it's sustainable source of funding, including federal funding, some kind of universal participation requirement around important data, and some process to create a more formalized partnership or designation of a partner. So you're not trying to figure that out in the middle of a pandemic. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And then we'd I really love, love to hear more from Melissa and David. Excellent, excellent. I certainly agree with those points. Um, I would add, um, I, I think the, the challenge and I have a policy background and I love policy is that policy a lot of times is set and you don't anticipate what are unintended consequences of policies. Mm. So I think as we're coming out of this pandemic, in addition to what Claudia said, there's gonna be a lot of focus on public health infrastructure. Yes. And so we need to understand as a community how we rebuild and or build from scratch that infrastructure in a way that can effectively link together the healthcare community and the public health community. And HIEs are the ideal place to do it because Excellent. then we make sure that all these connections exist and you can use data for these different purposes. And to your point um, on the social determinants area, you know, when you start getting out of HIPAA and you start getting into these other areas, we need to be looking creatively at all these different regulations and where there are unintended consequences and where we need to set up appropriate consent mechanisms. I mean, that's even work mm -hmm. that, you know, David and I are doing um, between our states. And, and so there's a lot of work to be done and it's possible to do this, but we need to take a fresh set of eyes on the policy side so that we, when we come out of this and there's gonna be a huge push to make drastic changes so we're not in the same position the next go round um, that we really utilize and leverage the foundational structure that's there through the HIE because it's not just public health focus. It's not just healthcare focus. Yes. It's really sharing information mm -hmm. to benefit all individuals and the community and public health. So um, I would just add that. I love it. Thank you, yeah. David. So build a, a, a state a health data utility that is mm -hmm. statewide and designated, that is regulated to focus on the public health purposes with some of the data either mandated or, or coming because of the state's own existing collection of data. Make that information available back out into the field using your utility. And so do all those things. And the things not to do is don't try to replicate what the national networks can do, what your regional HIEs are doing, the moving CCDs and that stuff. That's, that's not the, the place to focus. Instead, focus on these unique public health uh, needs. That would be my advice. I love it. And I see Felix and some others. I did not get to your question, but we are so grateful for everybody's participation in this forum today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just also echo, um, I want to wrap up today. Carla, Denise, I heard you say that you were raising your hand to help us as we go through this journey. And thank you so much to Melissa and to Claudia and to David um, for getting us launched as we support our policymakers to be able to really Im Im imagine the possible for California. Um, and I'd welcome for all of you that are interested in joining the coalition, connectingforbetterhealth.com is where you can get more information. And we have weekly calls that we would welcome you to join us um, as we go forward to share policy progress and education um, to be able to get others on, uh, on board. And I just, as I wrap up, we are really excited as this three-part series to be able to highlight HIE and public health. Our second one will be in April. We do not have a date yet, but we do and are very excited to be able to announce that we're going to be partnering with the California Initiative for Health Equity and Action to be able to support um, and co-sponsor this event. Uh, so look out for that. It'll be in April and it'll be focused around unlocking race and ethnicity data to address health disparities which we touched on here. And I, I also heard another note of um, social determinants might be, might be coming our way. So thank you again, everyone. We just, we appreciate it so much that you were able to be here today 
And um, thank you. Have a great afternoon. Excellent. Thanks, Timmy. Thanks, Libby. Excellent session. Right. It's good to thank see you. Everybody. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.